Hello and welcome to Breakout Nations with Ruchir Sharma. Uh, Ruchir, firstly, thanks very much for coming in on the show and sure. uh, taking time out to speak to ET now. And uh, congratulations, of course, on the launch of your book. Now, to begin with, I'm going to start by asking you about South Korea, which has made it to the gold medalist uh, position uh, in your book. Now, why is it that you've chosen South Korea? Because agreed, it is an open economy. Agreed, they have been uh, fairly proactive in terms of policy and mm -hmm. in terms of technological engineering innovation. They've been out there on top. But ultimately, it isn't a very large economy, 48 million people. That's about 40% the size of Maharashtra. Okay, I mean, like, uh, for, this is not my subjective sort of opinion on South Korea, but here's how the facts this thing stack up. There are only 15 economies in the world today with a size of more than a trillion dollars or so. South Korea ranks amongst them. So even though it has 48 million people, as you said, its per capita income is more than $20,000, which is what makes it a trillion dollar economy. So it's not a small economy, it's a trillion dollar economy. The other sort of reason for about South Korea is its historical performance. As I mentioned in the book, there are only two countries in the world which manage to grow at 5% on average each decade for five decades in a row. And Korea and Taiwan were two of them. So these are two economies which have done very well historically. They are, along with Japan, seen as the three big East Asian economic miracles. Of course, China is joining them now. But these are the three which are seen. So in fact, South Korea, me calling them as the gold medalist of growth, was not that difficult because amongst all the emerging markets, this is the one emerging market that has achieved sustained economic success and its size at a trillion dollars is like reasonable. So its population may be small, but its uh, per capita income is relatively high, which is what makes it a very meaningful economy on the global stage. Sure. Now, you know, we've all we've constantly been told that you know a, a favorable demographics for any country ought to be viewed as a strong barometer right. of the likely economic performance of that uh, of that economy you in the case of india dismissed india's uh, you know demographic uh, strength dividend, yeah. or dividend as pretty much a fad and you've actually uh, said that it is not something that is actually going to hold uh, you know strong for india to go forward now why would you do that because uh, research has demonstrated that yeah. In the past, a number of Asian economies have actually ridden their demographic dividend to get to the positions they are at. South Korea is one example, China, yes. Indonesia even. So why would you dismiss demographic dividend, especially in the case of India? No, I think that what I say about India is that, is that there's too much of a uh, mindset here where we take our growth for granted based on this, which is the, exactly this argument that all because we have a demographic surge, nothing else need matter. So we're an autopilot. Exactly. So I think that... Like to me, the whole point about the demographic dividend is that it is a necessary but not sufficient condition for growth. That there are enough examples in Africa and other places, even within India, the, uh, the large states of UP and Bihar with their you know, incredible demographic profile, which have uh, done quite poorly until you got good governance on top of it, which is what made them into sort of breakout states like Bihar over the past decade or so. So my entire point about demographics is that it is, it is a necessary but not sufficient condition for growth. And in India, it's a very dangerous mindset to believe that all because we have a good demographic profile, come what may, we will register growth rates of 7-8%. Now, some, some of the breakout nations you've listed include, you know, the likes of Turkey, Indonesia, Philippines, Poland. Now, what is it to you, to you that, you, why is it that you believe that these are going to be the next economic miracles? What are, these, what are the strengths of these economies that you believe will make them the next big stories? Yeah, I think it's very important for me here to define what a breakout story is or what's a breakout nation. And I think the two metrics I use here, one is expectations. I think expectations are really key because if you look at India's case, most people tell me that if, even if India grows at 6%, that's pretty good compared to the West which is likely to grow at 2% or so. And then you see what happened last year, when India's growth rate dipped from 8-9% from down to just below 7%, it led to a massive bear market in stocks, the uh, business confidence were, took a big hit, and also our fiscal uh, situation sort of got a, you know, somewhat out of control. Uh, so I think that expectations are key, that if India grows at 6%, that's going to be a real disappointing outcome. And the same thing holds for China, that in China, you know, people tell me the same thing that if India, uh, that if China's growth rate slows down to five, six percent, what's the big deal? But today, if you ask fund managers that will China have a hard landing, the answer is about less than 10 percent think they will. And how do they define a hard landing? A growth rate of seven percent or less. So if China grows at six percent next year, uh, it right. may appear high, but it's going to really feel very hard to the rest of the world. 
So I think that expectations are key. And so when I chose these nations, I've done it on the basis that what are the current consensus expectations about these countries and which countries will be able to beat these expectations. I think like to me that really is a very important metric. The second important metric I've used is per capita income, which is that if you look at the uh, growth profiles, if Korea is able to grow at 4% at a per capita income of more than $20,000, that's a very meaningful achievement. If India grows at 5% at a per capita income of $1,500, that's going to feel like a near depression out here. So I think those are the two metrics I've used in trying to identify breakout nations. So my point is not that a China or a Russia or a Brazil on which I come across as being somewhat negative are going to disappear from the face of this earth. The, you know, they will remain large economies, but then going forward for the next few years, I think their growth rates are all likely to disappoint relative to expectations, whereas the countries that I've chosen as breakout nations are countries which are likely to uh, benefit from low expectations and those expectations being exceeded, and also the fact that their per capita income is at levels where other countries in their same peer group will not do as well as they will do. So now one country that makes it to your breakout list is the Czech Republic. Right. Now they've got a population of 10 million. Yeah. They don't exactly have the most favorable demographics. Their yeah. population is in fact in decline. What, what actually works in their favor? I think this whole manufacturing bit in terms of that it's already been a success story that Czech used to be one of the most industrialized countries in the world before the First World War. Uh, and then like, it spent many years out in the wilderness. But the fact is that it's the most impressive comeback story in Eastern Europe in terms uh, after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall back in 1989. So I think that in Czech, it's, it's been a big success story in terms of how they have come back from the brink and they've been able to really create very good institutions out there and the fact that they're very little debt. So, you know, when we talk about Europe today, the first impression we have is of all these economies that are really burdened by enormous amounts of debt. And then you've got countries such as Poland and Czech, which are just outside the common currency, but part of the European Union, where the, uh, the uh, uh, growth profile is quite solid because the indebtedness of these countries is quite reasonable. Now, again, Ruchir, you've made very strong arguments uh, to say that, you know, the BRICS nations aren't anymore the big economic miracles they were touted to be 10 years ago. Now, do you believe all is lost for the BRICS markets or do you believe that, you know, there is some hope? And to your mind, what would it take for them to climb back? Uh, my entire point against BRICS is the fact that I, I'm against this aggregation of nations in terms of just clubbing nations together. And I think that this is a good marketing fad, but it's not something which really sort of makes any economic sense to me. So the reason why the BRICS came to be such a popular term over the past decade was more, I think, out of good luck rather than out of any other thing. Because if you, if you see what happened, last decade, every single emerging market did well. It's not as if BRICS did something special. Every single emerging market over the, pre, uh, over the last decade did well, particularly in those boom years of 03 to 07. Now, BRIC became popular because they captured the four largest emerging markets. So the maximum spotlight shone on them. And, there, and so today, I'm not saying that BRICS is over. All I'm trying to say is that when emerging market growth rates are all slowing down to a more reasonable level, the long-term average of around 5%, in that sort of environment, you'll get divergences. Some will do well, some will not do well. And we need to pick our winners. And there's nothing in common in BRIC apart from size. So what's the point in comparing India with a Russia or Brazil. First, India's per capita income is $1,500. Russia and Brazil are $12,000, $13,000. And secondly, uh, both those economies benefit enormously from higher commodity prices, whereas India gets hurt at, from these levels from higher commodity prices. And China is somewhere in the middle. China is in a different league of its own in terms of its size and, and where it is in the stages of development is a, is a different league of its own in terms of size in particular. So I think that my point here is against aggregation. That, and this aggregation became popular when every single emerging market was doing well. And I think that uh, this ended, uh, uh, yeah, like for me, when last year I heard some new acronym come up called CIVITS. All of a sudden now we have gone from talking about BRICS to talking about CIVITS, all because we want to group some nations together as a marketing uh, term and then peddle those uh, uh, terms out the to the... Exactly, uh, yeah, I mean, out to investors in... Uh, general. So nothing common between these markets is, is, is my point, that, that you'd rather sort of, uh, you know, invest in uh, individual success stories rather than, you know, sort of invest in concepts. Assuming that, you know, BRICS have indeed lost the plot, at least for the near term till they get their act together, 
where do you believe incremental fund flows are going to go? Because the economic miracles that you talk of do not have the capacity to absorb the large capital flows that the BRICS have been able to. Yeah. So in the interim, assuming that the BRICS don't get their act together for some time at least, maybe at least for the next five to seven years, where should we expect the money will go? Well, uh, two points here. One is that I'm not saying that no capital will flow to BRICS. What I'm trying to say is that relative to, to expectations, their growths will disappoint. That's my important point. India will still get some capital flows. It's not as if you know, capital will not come here. Other point is that I don't think capital flows to emerging markets are going to be anywhere near as strong as what we saw over the previous decade. Over the previous decade, we saw a multiple jump in capital flows to emerging markets. I don't think that those are going to be as strong anymore because the Western institutions and banks and the global financial system now is much more risk averse. So they're not in a mood now to you know, just pump money mindlessly into all markets across the world. So I, I think that's there. Now, the other point is that when a trend is about to begin or when a country is just emerging after having gone through a long period out in the wilderness, liquidity is always an issue. I talk about the Indian example of investing in India. Ten years ago, when the, you know, when the Indian stock market was just about to take off, uh, for me to even build a 1% position in a commodity stock in this country was incredibly difficult. It took a long, it took us six months to like even build a 1% position for our funds in some of these companies. But then once the companies did well, the trading volume surged. So there's, so, so like trading volumes almost tell you as to where sentiment is. And when trading volumes are very high, it, it tells you that sentiment is much too bullish. And the uh, converse is true. So if you look at emerging markets on a country basis, in the 1990s, the two largest emerging markets were Thailand and, Mal uh, and Malaysia. They used to corner 30% of the emerging market index and and there was hardly any china in there india too was you know relatively small and so many countries in eastern europe were not even part of this index and then something new happened so the whole idea here is that nothing is uh, lost everything is transformed to me that's the mantra